Hello, everybody. My name is Sergei Popruzhenko. I work at the Department of Theoretical Nuclear Physics of the Moscow Engineering Physics Institute, nowadays the Nuclear University. We filmed this video in time of the virus, when distant communications, and particularly e-learning, quickly become of primary significance. This is why at the Institute for Laser and Plasma Technologies, which is a part of our university, we came up with an idea to film a set of brief videos, brief lectures, which will introduce the audience, including distant audience, into the scientific directions of our institute, and in particular, of our department. The Department of Theoretical Nuclear Physics was founded in 1946. This is one of the oldest parts of our university. The first director was Igor Tam, who later became the Nobel Prize winner in physics. Since then, and during the old time of its existence, our department supported a broad variety of research in different fields of physics, including nuclear physics, condensed matter, optics, and in particular quantum optics, physics of intense electromagnetic and gravitational fields, and many others. Today, I will give you a brief introductory lecture about ultra-fast nonlinear optics, the field of research I am working in. It deals with the interaction of quantum systems like atoms, molecules, clusters of fullerenes with intense electromagnetic radiation. Intense radiation is typically produced by lasers. Therefore, this field of research is tightly connected to another one known as laser physics. When a system, whatever it is, a classical quantum system, is driven by a strong external force, it demonstrates highly nonlinear behavior. And this is the key part of this science. So we study highly nonlinear, very complicated, very involved quantum or classical dynamics of complex systems driven by strong external forces. This is challenging. This is interesting, and this offers promising applications. Another key point of this title is ultrafast. When we say ultrafast, we mean something which happens very quickly. And for Lyman, I think everything which happens faster than in one second is fast or ultrafast, not for a physicist, because in physics, saying which, that something happens quickly, we have to indicate quickly with respect to what. Therefore, it is important to understand what the nomination ultrafast means in this context. It means that using very short laser pulses, which nowadays can be as short as one femtosecond, one femtosecond is 10 to minus 15 seconds, and even shorter, we can control such fast processes as nuclear motion in molecules. And we even accessing now a control of electron motion in atoms, which happens on time scales shorter than one femtosecond. This, explain, this explains the ultra fast nature of these processes. And this explains why we need extremely short, strong laser pulses to access this phenomenon. In the forthcoming presentation, I will give you more details about this science. I will try to explain you why it is interesting to study such processes in experiment and theory why it is promising and which applications 
can be accessed by using this phenomenon. Well, now I turn to the presentation, which aims to give you a brief explanation on the fundamentals of ultra-fast nonlinear optics and at second physics. I will start from this plot, which I bought from the excellent review by Ferenc Krauss and Misha Ivanov, dedicated to at second physics. It shows some landscape where you can see different quantum systems. Atoms, molecules, nanostructures, electronic subsystems, nuclear subsystems, subsystems of, of different uh, quantum objects. This is placed in the time space plane, which shows you typical temporal scales and typical sizes of these systems. One can notice that uh, as long as nuclear motion in molecules is concerned, which is responsible for chemical reactions, this corresponds to the time scale between 10 to minus 15, 10 to minus 12 seconds. So this is between one femtosecond and one picosecond. If we turn from nuclear motion to the motion of electrons inside molecules, inside atoms, inside solids, whatever, this brings us to much shorter time scales between one attosecond, 10 to minus 18 seconds, and one femtosecond. So, how could we control these very short time intervals? There is a universal scheme, one of the schemes possible, to control such very fast phenomena, which is known as the pump probe scheme. It can be realized in different ways, but typically it, realized, it is realized with uh, optical devices. Uh, if we have two light pulses delivered by one source or two different sources, one of these pulses calls pump. It goes first, it is shown in red, it arrives to the target, to the sample first, excites it, or makes something with this sample, and then, after a controllable time delay, which can be sufficiently short, another pulse, which calls probe and is shown in red, arrives to the same sample and reads out what happened to the target. This is the universal scheme, which allows to control fast processes, which duration is comparable to the time delay between two pulses. Where can we take these pulses? Typically from lasers. Here you can see the three Nobel Prize winners who received this prize in 1964 for invention of measures, which uh, basically similar sources of electromagnetic radiation, similar to lasers, they just generate in a different uh, frequency or wavelength domain. And these are bus of Prokhorov and Towns. 60 years ago, these devices looked like that. This is Towns with one of uh, his first measures. Now, lasers, modern lasers, look like it is shown on the right part of, of, of the picture. 
they deliver pulses of, of uh, different intensity, total energy, duration, etc. And uh, at the present, we consume an extremely broad a variety of laser sources from very weak and uh, almost constant, constantly working uh, lasers for uh, medicine up to extremely intense powerful lasers with very short pulses. This curve shows how the pulse duration of electromagnetic radiation delivered by laser system, systems evolved historically from relatively long pulses of the first Maimon's laser. The first laser was built by Theodore Maimon in 1960. The pulse was as long as 100 microseconds. From the Lyman viewpoint, this is still very short, but not from the viewpoint of our interest, uh, where we are going to control motion of electrons and nuclei. From this point of view, those pulses were extremely long, as long as atomic time as probably probably the the uh, time life of the universe longer than uh, that of uh, of a human being but later on after the invention of of uh, the laser due to different technical achievements shorter and shorter pulses had been generated and this curve shows you that very quickly we went from 100 microseconds to 100 femtoseconds and later on new technical breakthroughs which included so-called care uh, model locking allowed to shorten laser pulses even more up to the natural limit what this natural limit is it is clear that a pulse of electromagnetic radiation cannot be shorter than a single optical period just because of of uh, the uh, typical property of any Fourier transform which which connects this, the spectral width of of uh, uh, the electromagnetic uh, bunch and its temporal duration. The longer the pulse duration is, the narrower the spectrum is. But uh, it cannot be it cannot be too broad, and if we think about laser pulses which have duration comparable to a duration of the single oscillation this means they are already extremely broad from the spectral viewpoint and this is the limit so that if we take such a pulse as, as shown in, in in the right uh, hand part of, of, of this uh, slide which contains only one oscillation, it uh, will have a duration about one femtosecond or maybe a bit more because optical and infrared frequencies correspond to the optical period about two femtoseconds. And therefore it is the natural limit for duration of electromagnetic pulses 
delivered by conventional lasers, which are based on, on uh, crystals or gases. Therefore, if we come back to our palm probe scheme, where two pulses are involved, having this limit in mind, we could immediately conclude that using ordinary laser pulses, we can control processes of femtosecond time duration. 10 to minus 15 seconds, maybe 10 to minus 13, more, but not less. And therefore, this means that conventional lasers can cover very well so-called femtosecond domain. And this fact means that using these pulses within the pump probe scheme we can influence for example motion of nuclei in the molecular and therefore we can influence chemical reactions well the influence in chemical reactions is not not something extraordinary new. People know how to control chemical reaction for ages. There are different methods, but they work in a different way. So typically, before this 10 to second epoch, we controlled chemical reactions by setting up some average conditions for them, like temperature, concentration of the agents, which do react by adding some other ingredients in order to provide catalysis by irradiating by photons, etc. These methods allow to control chemical reactions in average, and they left no way going in inside a single reaction in order to change something which happens when the molecular evolves from one state to another one. This had become possible when femtosecond laser pulses became available for experiments. And this almost immediately gave rise to a new field of physics or better to say a new field which emerged in between of physics and chemistry and is now known as femtochemistry this is exactly about manipulating chemical reactions by irradiating the agent the, uh, the ingredients of, of, of a chemical reaction by very short laser pulses. So we excite the molecular and then the nuclear subsystem evolves so that the internuclear separation becomes larger. Some electrons are leaving from the molecular, some electrons redistribute their density and then we can look at this, we can control these processes and at some point decide, okay, this is the best time to send another pulse where this will, for example, break some bones or redistribute the population. And this has been shown to work. For inventing this field of science, Ahmed Zewail received the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1999. And uh, the plots uh, on these slides, in the bottom of these slides, uh, show the evolution of a benzene molecular 
irradiated by a short laser pulse and then controlled by another probe pulse. 500 femtosecond after the interaction, two picoseconds after the interaction. And this control allows us to understand the evolution. Now, if we want to do the same with electrons, which move much, much faster than, than uh, nuclei, we need much shorter pulses. If we had such pulses, we could think about manipulating atomic electrons, electrons in molecules, and uh, in solids. These would open another very promising field of science, which could be called other chemistry. when on top on those possibilities which femtochemistry brings to us, we could add manipulation or control of electron motion. We are on the way to this new field of science. But in order to get there, apparently, it should be clear from what I have said before, we need electromagnetic pulses which are shorter than one femtosecond. They cannot be delivered by conventional lasers for the reasons I have just explained. So that we need some new method to create electromagnetic radiation of high intensity of controllable properties of high level of coherency and very short duration. There is a way to do this and it was invented by several people in the beginning of the 90s. The most known work which contributed into this new field was uh, published in 1993 by Paul Corkum, who is now recognized as one of the founders of the other second science. The idea of this approach is based on the currently very well studied phenomenon of nonlinear ionization. What is this? When you put an atom into a strong electromagnetic field, the field alters the potential which traps the electron nearby the nucleus. This thick line shows the distorted potential. Then the electron could quantum mechanically tunnel through this tilted well and become free. Not literally free it becomes because there is a laser field all around and it moves the electron back and forth. And finally, the electron could be returned back to the parent ion, the atom, it was removed from a couple of femtoseconds before. And upon this visit back to the apparent ion, which caused a collision, the electron could recombine back into the ground state and emit a high energy photon. Because the strong laser field drives electrons up to relatively high energies, which may easily reach dozens of electron volts. The energy of this emitted photon could also be on of the order of, of dozens of electron volts, even hundreds of electron volts. This is much, much bigger than the energy 
of a laser photon. So that in, the, in this way, using this scheme, we can coherently convert laser radiation of one electron volt frequency into electromagnetic radiation of 10 electron volt or 50 electron volt or hundreds of electron volt frequency. The bigger the frequency is, the shorter is the shortest pulse duration is. So if we take this radiation, which is known as high harmonic radiation, why harmonic is present there? Because the process is periodical, the electron can escape every laser period, it can return back every laser period, therefore everything what is going on with the system is more or less periodical. As it is periodical, the radiation is discrete. Therefore, emitted photons have energy which is uh, proportional, not only proportional, which is just uh, uh, the prime number of uh, the initial photon energy. To better to say odd number because of symmetry properties. Therefore, not a continuous spectrum, but a discrete spectrum of, of radiation is emitted. Well, this is a way to convert low frequency radiation into high frequency radiation. Itself, it is not that spectacular, particularly taking into account that uh, the conversion efficiency is not that high. Nevertheless, it allows to generate very short pulses because these high harmonics are highly coherent and manipulating these harmonics, selecting several harmonics with phases which add up in a desirable way, we can construct an extremely short electromagnetic pulse. This has been shown to be the case. Therefore, using nonlinear ionization and high harmonic generation, one could produce relatively intense and extremely short electromagnetic pulses. This slide shows one of devices dedicated to this uh, task. It works at the Max Planck uh, Institute for Quantum Optics in Garchen, but nowadays there are many devices of, of such sorts. Uh, at least dozens, maybe hundreds, all over the world in different laser laboratories. Of course, the realization of, of this scheme targeted to generate stable, relatively intense sub femtosecond pulses of desirable properties. This realization is not that easy. One has to apply different techniques in order to cut necessary harmonics from the whole high harmonic spectrum. Here, schematically, this total spectrum of high harmonics generated by some atomic target is shown. So if we cut some part of this spectrum, which is which part is indicated by a dashed line, using different filters, which could be intensity sensitive or so-called temporal gating, using polarization, two color schemes, etc. This or that way we did this. If we did this, we can add these harmonics up together coherently and generate a very short pulse, which is shown here. With this short pulse, 
we could approach the initial task of control of the electron motion in atoms and molecules. How short such pulses could be in practice? This is a snapshot from one of the first publications dedicated to the generation of other second pulses. It was done in 2001. Then, using the scheme I have just described, the experimentalist obtains pulses of electromagnetic radiation, which were as short as 250 attaseconds, a quarter of a femtosecond. Here, the dash line shows the pump laser pulse radiation, and one can compare this period to the period of the at the second pulse. Currently, it is possible to generate at the second pulses of less than one at one hundred at the second duration. This is an example taken from publication which is almost 10 years old, but nevertheless, it remains more or less up-to-date achievement. So far, as far as I know, no pulses shorter than 50 at the seconds have been generated, but having something between 50 at a seconds and few hundred at a seconds is already a great breakthrough into the domain of control of electron motion. What could be done with such pulses? They can be applied to control different delays in photo process. So using at second pulses, we can now answer a question, for example, of how long does it take to relax for an atom where you have created an electron hole in some electron subshell. So we remove an electron from an atom, from an inner shell of an atom, create a hole there, and then wait until the atom, the electron subsystem of the atom relaxes back. So some electrons from the upper shell move down to the inner shell to fill this vacancy before it could not be controlled in the time-resolved domain. Now it is possible because duration of this process extremely short is extremely short, but it is not shorter than duration of these at the second pulses. Another way, another application is to look at correlations in complex electron systems. This includes atoms, molecules, and solids. Then we can now access ultra-fast molecular dynamics. We can look and control and influence what is going on with electron subsystems of reacting molecules in the process of chemical reaction. And we therefore can manipulate different bones. We can accelerate or decelerate processes which are responsible for formation of new molecules from the given agents. Another important application is so-called charge migration in large molecules. When you excite, this uh, slide shows exactly this process. Then you excite a large molecular, for example, 
biomolecule, which consists of, of uh, a number of, of uh, radicals, nuclei, and it is absolutely impossible to describe this molecule from the viewpoint of quantum mechanics. It is too complicated for that. So that if you only have theory in hands, you can do nothing about description of such processes. All the information which can be extracted should rely on experiment. And now we have an experimental tool which allows to trace temporarily how the density of electron charge migrates from one side of the molecular to another one after this molecular has been excited. Why it is important? It is important because you need to know where the electrons are in order to proceed with this or that chemical reaction. In order to break a molecular in two or more pieces in a desirable way. The more complicated the molecular is, the more difficult to control this and the more important to control it because uh, the number of puff days for molecular dissociation grows enormously with the molecular size. Finally, we turn to tell a few words about solids because this is another very fresh emerging area of research. What happens if you irradiate solids by intense laser pulses? This also can be only controlled at very short time domains because typically for solids, the energetic distance between the valence band where the electrons seed before the process of excitation happened. And the conductive band is a few electron volts. Few electron volts means some fractional of m femtosecond. Therefore, if you look, if, if you create excitations of, of solids, and of course, this is a very complicated process because in solids you can typically not uh, ignore the interaction between electrons, electrons and phonons, etc. This is very difficult to describe, and therefore, possibilities to experimentally control that become more and more important. So, if you look at solids, in such situations, and you want to trace the electron evolution, you also need after second pulses. And this is what is now being developed more and more because these after second pulses have become available. Finally, it has been realized a couple of years ago that we can do some other second measurements and develop other second physics, even without using other second light pulses, because we can create something at a second, something extremely short, not only from light, but also from matter. This matter is the electrons themselves, which are removed from an atom or molecular in the process of nonlinearization. So this plot again shows you what I have already demonstrated a couple of slides before that upon the nonlinearization, the electrons could simply go away from the system, whatever the system is, or they can return back and recombine, or they can return back and scatter, or they can return back and kick out another electron, which calls non-sequential, double or multiple ionization, 
And if we look at those electrons, which scattered on the same atom, they have been removed from a couple of femtoseconds before, we may notice that there are different ways to scatter. The electron could go this way down or this way up. This means in the spectra of these scattered electrons, there must be some interference. So if we can record this interference experimentally, this will give us some information about the other second dynamics, which is behind the scattering. And this idea is in the basis of so-called time-resolved holography with photoelectrons. This is a work which has been done in 2011, and I was a part of this team which made the first experiment proving that such a photoelectron holography could be experimentally realized. The picture to the right shows the sort of that it shows what electron distribution, but this distribution can be interpreted as a sort of hologram, which is generated by two beams. One beam is so-called reference, which goes to the detector without being scattered. Another beam is the probe beam, which arrived to the same detector having the same momentum, but after being scattering on the atom or the molecular or whatever, which was the source of this electron. And therefore, the interference of these two beams allows us to read the structure of the object or the evolution of this object. Of course, for atoms, this is not of interest. We know about atoms much more than such a hologram can ever tell us. But for complex molecules, this could be a way to summon new information about the structure with unprecedented temporal resolution. This is the idea of time-dependent at the second photoelectron holography. So, to summarize my presentation, the field of ultra-fast nonlinear optics, and in particular at the second physics, deals with processes which happen on the time scale between several dozen of attoseconds and several hundreds of femtoseconds. In order to investigate such processes, we need lasers, which are strong enough to excite nonlinear quantum or classical dynamics of those systems we are interested in. This field of science offers us unique possibilities to probe very complex objects, like complex molecules, for example, or solids, with time resolution and actually also space resolution, which has never been achieved before. Thank you very much for your attention.